A lot of my work is about, uh, is about the voice. It's about speaking. Uh, it's, uh, it is another quotation that I want to say from Kleist. He's a writer, a German writer and a philosopher, and he said that actually the act of thinking is through speech. Like all this funny thing that we have in our head floating around, it's not really thoughts. And thoughts can only form through the act of speaking. And I was always uh, kind of uh, attracted by this uh, material that was impossible to work with it before the machines that we have today. So um, how to capture uh, speaking or how to work with it is a, is a very challenging uh, kind of uh, way to deal with in art but I'm, I'm very lucky to live in a, in a time where uh, more or less the obligation for an artist, a contemporary artist, is to work with contemporary tools. And, uh, and so it's complicated, but I kind of like it. So there, I will show you several works that I did uh, in different ways uh, articulating or uh, kind of trying to capture what is the field of speaking and how can we include it in the world of art and the works of art. I'm a little bit jet-lagged, so be patient with me. So the first work I will talk to, uh, about is a work that actually in the work itself you don't see the act of speaking and you don't hear the words. The words were behind. I was invited to Dublin in 2003 to uh, visit a part of the city, the North Inner City. And I came there and they gave me a tour and they said, you absolutely have to make a project here. And, uh, and this is a part, like this was it. And they showed me the, the area. This area was in, in the rapid gentrification from, uh, there was like so many architectural different uh, buildings and, uh, and facades and uh, everything was changing rapidly and I was very impressed by that diversity. But it was also a place that there was a lot of crime, a lot of drugs and a lot of whatever happened in this kind of rapid changes. They, if you remember, there was a part of uh, Dublin that uh, you didn't have to pay taxes if you moved your business to there. So uh, it was very, very um, cruel kind of change that was induced on the city. So after kind of walking around, I really felt kind of in love in the, with the different forms of architecture. It was like a museum. And I decided I'm going to photograph the buildings that I like. But for that, I had to ask the permission of the people that this is there for sale. So I asked those people after photographing, I went to each of them and I asked them, can I photograph your house after I chose them? And then I decided to do a project about projections. It means uh, when you project, usually you work in projection in art, you usually do it for one evening, for one night, uh, maybe two. And I decided that if we do it, we have to make it more ambitious. So I wanted to have 20 projections. I wanted to have it for a month. It's a big operation to pull it. And so I needed for each image, I needed to take the, to decide which one I want, to ask a person, can I photograph your facade? And then the other person, can I project on your facade? And the third person, can you please take this enormous projector into your house to project it on the wall and to host it? So it took a year to discuss it because sometimes it was a building with a lot of apartments. And people had to decide if they want or not their place to be photographed. And so they kind of liked the discussions. And so we had a huge discussion, what is art, what is photography, what is walking around. So in the end, I created this labyrinth. What I did, I took a photograph of one facade and I actually projected it a little bit further 
because in the night when you walk around, you actually don't see the buildings, you, but you see a projection. So when you come to open your building, actually you can see somewhere else. There was like a, a shift, like a labyrinth, so, and a local historian would talk, would make little walks with groups that never walked through this. They always went around it. And uh, it was an interesting kind of experience to do it slowly. I would walk slowly in the street with a Leica camera, and the police would come to me and say, do not do that. They will take away your camera. And then the drug dealers, and there were a lot of them, would come to me and they said, they told you that we will snitch your camera, right? So there was kind of a slow talking and a slow walking. And it kind of, in the end, it worked. So I'll show you a little bit. There was a young uh, filmmaker that did a film around it. I'll show you a little bit of it. So this is Liz, she's a director of the fire station artist, the residency, and she helped me, of course, to go around to the resident and say, Can, is it okay uh, if we bring the projector in there and shine over there? And uh, there was, you know, she was very, showed the photograph of the works and which buildings we would like to use to project. And they could choose if it would be black and white or red, because I decided also that after a week in black and white, the image, I would put a filter in red, so they would not be bored. And the red filter, the red color, also has like a, a property of crystallization of a situation. So if you look through red, uh, there is like a, another feeling that comes into your body. So I use it, it comes from etiomedicines, it's a certain kind of... Um, healing process that I like very much the property of this of this uh, red filter so it, so it, it was an intense work and uh, the projection in the end took quite a lot of uh, of effort to do I'll just go a little bit further uh, this is the installation of the of the big uh, projector and sometimes people had this projector, and you see it's pretty big. Uh, and the projector would be there for a month in their bedroom. And in the, in the street, there would be all these youngsters with phones. And I never knew if they are drug dealers, drug users, or just kids, because it was all kind of a mixture. But we had great talks. And... Uh, not one projector was moved during the month. Not one projector, projected surface was uh, mutilated or there was nothing. Nobody really did to it. While people before told me, and we had to insure the projectors uh, and everything, the gobos, like it's uh, also, a, the, it's not slides, it's a gobo, it's a very expensive kind of device because we had to um, project it for a long time. It was started in the evening. It would go for four or five hours. And the surfaces of the buildings would actually influence the image. So this kind of, it became like a fuzzy image. I remember there was a woman from the museum, she came to me and said, but you should put a white surface so your images would be very nice and you would not kind of... Uh, uh, damage them. But I wanted the damage. I wanted these two surfaces more or less melting into each other and creating a new image.
After a year, I photographed those projections. After a year, I went, was invited again to come. This is the Gobos. To come to the city and to... And to uh, uh, by then, I, I printed photographs. And I exhibit them in several places, in Berlin, in Sweden. And those photographs uh, were after invited back to the city. We did a catalog. We wrote very nice text by very nice people. And, and it's like now the work is owned by different collectors and museums in different places. And kind of their facade became a work of art that is living somewhere else. So you see this part, this part, for instance, is completely gentrified, it's very beautiful, and next to it, there's completely other places. This is why we're installing it. And it really changes very much, the surrounding, when, when you do that. And what was nice, like this woman, she said in the end, okay, when do you do the next project? You know, she, she thought that art should be something that she would like to, to be close to. This is the opening. Yeah. So this was Daedalus. And Daedalus, I called it Daedalus because of... Uh, the Greek mythology and because of um, James Joyce, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where he is sitting in another city trying to remember Dublin and trying to see if, if, uh, if the city, uh, if the traitoire goes this way and, uh, and how can you remember, is it possible to remember a place? So here, the, the talking of the people is behind the, war, the work, and you don't hear them, but you see it. In another work, I was uh, uh, invited to teach in another university in Sweden for a couple of months, and it was a place where there was a beautiful big, fa the core of the city was factories building that were closed since 30 years. And they were... I was walking around, and they were really in the middle of the city. And there was the river go flowing there. Everything was designed. Everything was beautiful. Everything was calm. You saw that what, that was factories, but today there was museum and other things. And uh, and it it was the calmness. The, there was no sound, nothing of the, of it. And so I decided, I, 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 I thought I would do a project there. I, would, I was asked to do a project. And I wanted to talk with women that worked in the factories while being pregnant and having kind of lived in this huge noise, this enormous noise. And I said to the curator, you know, I would really like to, to, to talk with these women and to see if they remember the noise. And if, you know, maybe their daughter remembered the noise too, you know, because you were one body, what do we know? And she said, oh, this is no problem. My mother worked there, and she has a group of five ladies. They all have daughters. And uh, you, you, we, we can ask them if they want to participate. So I went to the museum where there were still some machines. I recorded the machines. I reworked it with musical instrument, digital instrument, with two musicians. And we kind of, more or less, made uh, as if you come close to the machine, you go away from the machine, you, you make the, the noise kind of move. And then I, I filmed the, each time the mother and the daughter on a green screen behind them, means like I can insert behind them something listening to this huge noise that was like the, the, we had four huge speakers and they were sitting together and listening. 
What I found in the museum, I found also blueprints of the machines that were in those uh, in this uh, in these factories. But by now, the machines were gone, and the blueprints were not complete. And I asked the art, an artist of 3D to <clears throat> recreate it, recreate those machines, but without only to take the blueprints, and even if they are not complete, not to try to inform himself somewhere else just to work with what is there. And he, he had to struggle quite a lot because he really wanted to make it right. And then the machines that came out, they were kind of weird. And so we created this 3D factory that we implanted behind the women. And the, now, the, the, now the machines are there uh, and they are not producing anything, but what they do they actually uh, respond to the women relationship, like the mother and the daughter. If this, when they are in the sound, if they are very calm and don't move, the machines are very slow. Uh, but if they are very enthusiastic, the machines are very fast. And I ask them, I talk to them, do you remember? Like after they listened to it, I stopped it and I asked, do you remember the noise? And they said, you know what, we don't remember the noise, but I remember when it stopped. So it was very amazing what is noise and what, how noise comes into memory as a constructor of, uh, and, and where, where does it bring us when we kind of feel it? Uh, uh, it was a year later, no, two years later, I think, when it was shown in the museum. And after that, in Jeu de Pomme, they came to Jeu de Pomme these women that worked to, to see this installation. And they said that that made them think about the whole period when they were working in a completely different, different way. So I will let you see a little bit of this installation. So this is the museum, machines. I'll let you listen oh, a little bit. And when I install it, the sound is outside of the museum. And the, when you come in, it's completely silent. So this is where I recorded it. And this woman is so devoted, she's so grand. So she works this machine and they are dying every day because they are old machines. They're not really, really, because the machines were big. Mind you, by now we, we actually, because there was one moment I thought I'm gonna go there when the machines, and I would take, the, I would record it, the sound. But the machines moved from Sweden to Lithuania to China, and I think they are now in the United States somewhere, if I'm not wrong. and to come to bring them. So this is what I remembered from our interview. I put it there in writing. And this is the installation. Oh, what did I do? It disappeared. Of course, the old guys that worked in the factories would come to the exhibition and have huge discussions saying this is not the right thing. There is something absolutely wrong in this factory. But the rest of us just enjoyed very much those green, beautiful machines. So this was sound machine. And another part that is in, in the, in, 
in whatever noise and sound is, is also the part of silence. So I will show you a, a project that I did in the, in the City Hall in Paris and the uh, Memorial of the Holocaust uh, invited three artists to propose how can you show the, the, the that was 60 years of the liberation of uh, the um, Auschwitz concentration camp and there were 60 people living in the surrounding of Paris and they interviewed them to give uh, the their memory and whatever happened, the testimony of being there. And uh, I did a pretty large installation and they actually, they, they took my uh, proposition and uh, I showed the 60 of them in a very large hall on very, like little computers like that, uh, DVD readers where you could listen to the whole interview. And on and then you can also go forward, what I do now. And on the other hand, I took the parts where before they answer, this, all the silences when they are wanting to give you the answer and they are thinking about it. So on one hand, you could listen to two to nine hours without editing of their interviews. And on the other three screens, there was this film of the 60 of them. Uh, this is only the space of silence. So I'll show you.
this is the city hall and I designed these tables and uh, where you can sit, everybody can sit and listen. So there was silent, there was light and uh, people could listen to whatever they want. They want, they could accelerate, they could go back. They were the masters of the listening because I think speaking, the other part of speaking is of course the listening. It was very successful. It was in the middle of Paris and it was always full and people came all the time and it, it, people queued. So the, the survivors, they came to me after and they said it was really very successful what you did. Suddenly we had people from all ages and all, uh, 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 you know, different people would come in in the break lunch and just sit there and listen a little bit and come again in the end of the work. So it did create a, a space that they could absolutely listen. And uh, this is the guy from the city hall that is checking if this is possible to steal or not. Nobody stole anything. Yeah. So uh, now, um, now we will see this last project that I did that is still on, uh, on show, describing labor. So I was invited to come to the Wilsonian in Miami uh, by the help of somebody that sits in the audience here. Uh, to, after Gary saw my exhibition in Jeu de Pomme, he said, you absolutely have to go and see this place. And uh, I went, and yeah, it's such an amazing place. And, uh, and so I, I went there for 10 days of uh, a residency and to see what is that I am, just to go through the archive, and I, I don't like archives. Uh, archive has this kind of uh, law of, uh, being efficient, uh, to put things that the same size together, uh, to separate chairs from tables, and do another kind of uh, order with what we call history. I, I did it in other works too, but there it was really surprising that I was actually taken by works that depicted labor, because I realized that actually since 45, that was the last time we saw a lot of labor. And even when painters were wanted to say, we are free artists, they painted the peeling of potatoes by the people. So that was like the labor was where the artist could say, no, 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 I don't paint the king, I paint peeling potato because I am a free artist. And then during the beginning, like the two world wars, the image of the worker were used by the propaganda, be it Russian, communism, be it American, be it Italian, be it uh, German. And suddenly it was banned from our ima imagery, like nobody used anymore the worker. And we had all this wonderful object around us that we didn't have the image of who created them. I thought it's kind of weird because we photograph everybody today and everything and we send it over and we want other people to react to it and suddenly this one, they are not there, even if they are there. So I thought I will do a collection, I will choose and I chose like 40 of the works that I found there and then we did a huge work around finding the artist that did them to find a trace and to find what the artist said about it. So on one hand, we recorded somebody reading all this, uh, all this, what the artist said. After that, I asked the museum to find me because I don't like to choose people. I work always with people that 
participate in my work, but I don't want to choose them. I was asked to the museum to find them I, because I think it, it, to, to share the responsibility is a much greater act of contamination. And, uh, and so I wanted people that know to speak about art, be it artists, collectors, people that work in the museum, people that know, writers that can come and choose one of the works and describe it on video. Like, take a work and see what is that you see there. Well, I can describe you forever. It will never be you. It's like this image in the mirror. It's this other thing that makes us try to go somewhere, but never is satisfying. And the act of speaking was also very interesting because it revealed suddenly what do we think and say when we look at a work of art, because usually we are mute. We look at a work of art and we just look at it. But there is other things happening. That's uh, this also what happened during this project. So I will let you listen to, whoops. So after every, each of the person chose one work and described it on the video, and what happened in this, uh, it, I did two videos. One video was of the description of the person describing, but you don't see the work. And the other description of the same work was done by the eye of the camera, where the camera is scrutinizing the surface of the work that is sometimes this size, uh, in this mechanical eye, this one eye. Or near Bloomington, there's a it's a huge limestone um, quarry right outside Bloomington, and the I only know two things about him. Uh, I know one that he, that he worked in the quarry, and uh, my grandfather told me the story about him that for fun at night he would sit around the fire with his friends and uh, he would bend nails with his hands, you know that was one of the things they did for fun. And I never knew whether that was true or not, or whether that was one of those stories that becomes more inflated over time. Uh, and then he also, he died in the quarry as well. He was, he was actually crushed by a rock and that was how he died. And my grandfather was, was very young when it happened, which is why um, you know, he hasn't really been able to tell me that much about him. Um, so that was why I picked that one because I made it, I mean, I looked at it and I was like, oh wow, that's, that's probably exactly what he did. <laughs> it's, you know, he had a pickaxe and a mallet and he was breaking rocks all day. Um, He chose two works. I guess a different kind of dignity in this picture too, the way they're standing. Because in some ways they're hunched over, they're, some of their shoulders are up, um, as if you know they've been carrying this incredible burden all day. Um, but the, it's interesting though, the, there's one who's sort of cleared the edge. It almost seems like there's this, there's this very clear demarcated exit point of the mud, and the one who's cleared it and is walking away and his shoulders are very much more back and down and his chest is more out. As if like, you know, he's breathing air for the first time again. Um, and he seems the most dignified of all of them. Um, even though all their postures are upright, it's, it's almost interesting how they, they appear filthy and, um, and weary and yet not, not defeated in any way. I like it because uh, although you have the worker who should be in action actually is in a moment of, of pause 
and what uh, the symbolic wheel that he holds in his hand having a wing that actually suggests the wheel the movement the motion of the rolling stock because it is uh, a factory that manufactures railroad carriages so that uh, it is uh, a railroad carriage is supposed to travel to move, therefore, and um, the movement is enhanced also somehow by the wings, the wing that is attached to one side of the wheel, and um, <coughs> many actually several railroad companies even nowadays in Europe have a wheel with one or two wings attached to it as their logo. So uh, it brings me back to Europe a little bit. Um, otherwise, the, the representation of the worker is that of the heavy toiling worker in a workshop where there is a lot of heat, that's why he has his upper part bare and um, the whole body shows that it was developed during work so that the, the muscles are not too exaggerated, they are, it was before the time of, uh, uh, of enhancing uh, uh, substances and uh, when before the time of genes. Uh, first of all, the notion of what made this country great is here in uh, seeing steel workers, the steel workers who built America. And um, you see the steel workers are also represented by the diversity of race that we have here, which was pretty unique in the world. And uh, that's very well illustrated here also. And then the might, the power of a country at work, the smokestacks, the steams, the fire, the pouring, and of course on the right is this mysterious brick wall and a shadow, a man, is he a shadow? Is he really walking? He's in a shadow, there's the reflection of fire, the, the earth being formed, the moment of that extraordinary heat, the core of our earth that's under us at this moment, that iron on fire is so palpable in this work. So there's passion and there's a sense of the beginning of time and also of hell, the end of time. You have that dichotomy functioning here. On a pure visual level, the orange of fire, the red of fire, the yellow of the workers' shirts, the blue of the uniform, and then somehow mysteriously the bottom part of the picture is green and I've been looking to see is that water is that life-giving water do I have the entire scenario of Genesis here where in the beginning the world was flooded and covered with water because it certainly looks like there's a flood behind them and they're elevated on blocks man-made it's man versus the elements man harnessing the elements, man and the elements. It is such an allegorical piece contained in this two-dimensional plane, you almost forget you're looking at a piece of paper. So the video has 24 people that describe the work. And, then and I thought that wasn't enough, so I asked also musician a group of musicians to look at the work, to pick a work, and to further describe it. And because 
I, I, I wasn't yet satisfied, so we, we can listen to some of the pieces. I'll choose it by ran, random. Mm. It was six, music six musicians, some of them from the group, the Brooklyn Riders, and with additional three others. I also decided to create with uh, their help, I was invited uh, by the Toledo uh, Art Museum to realize I wanted to do glass hammers, like this kind of, uh, to transform. There's like, there was like a transformative, like the works were spoken and were made into music. And I thought it would be also very good if I managed to do some glass hammers that gives you the feeling of uh, of of another kind of transportation of trans like a transformation without being transformed because the, the, I wanted them exactly the same size and so they were hanging in the museum like uh, like the tools that we know in the same way. And that was also very beautiful to work with the glass artists in the, they have a wonderful uh, workshop for glass. So they do usually very beautiful vases and suddenly they had to do uh, those hammers and they, I think everybody enjoyed it. We, I also also to do something to do with the hand of the worker. So we also created a glove, two gloves. After each person from the 24 described the work, I invited them to take the work and to go down to the floor wherever, where they are stored, where the storage of the objects, because the flat works are stored in another place. And I wanted them to go around and to choose a place, random, where they feel this work can be. And I photographed it in, with a very good camera and, and tried to, I'll just kind of choose them all, more, some of them.
And so this person that described this image of this hard working drill decided to to put it on this so called she said noise produced by the design of this furniture, revealing slowly each work. This is the other work that was described by Michelle. She wanted to put it in the vicinity of metal object. And slowly it was kind of a walk through this way of what we do with what we call history and what we call our objects. And it created, uh, this is the first person that spoke that. And it created this kind of mysterious, when I came first in this place, it was like, we always go to uh, like attics or very mysterious places and we imagine other times and other memories that maybe we didn't have, maybe we share with other people. And I'll just finish with a describing of some of the works of one work. Ah, this is the music. Okay, you can listen to more of the music, but I wanted rather to find... Oh, here it is, sorry. sorry. Minor Joe. 1942, screen print by Elizabeth Olds, New York City. Commenting on printed media, the artist wrote, graphic artists who hope to interest the millions in art must work in terms of what is vital and real to people generally. Early prints were purposeful. The groups of artists working cooperatively on one theme, such as building a bridge or digging a tunnel, could turn out thrilling picture histories of changing civilization, techniques, and construction. Coordinated with explanatory text, these picture stories could easily be assimilated into the educational fabric the whole wide world of America today is the subject matter of printmakers of mass production prints. It wasn't easy to find all of them. Sometimes. The Grand Affair, circa 1889. Bronze tin and brass sculpture by Arthur Wagen, Paris. Now, this sculpture depicts the construction of the Eiffel Tower, built for the Paris International Exhibition of 1889. An observer of this wrote, a thick cloud of tar and coal smoke seized the throat, and we were deafened by the din of metal screaming beneath the hammer. Over there, they were still working on the bolts. Workmen with their iron bludgeons perched on a ledge just a few centimeters wide. They took turns at striking the bolts. One could have taken them for blacksmiths, contentedly beating out a rhythm on an anvil in some village forge, except that these smiths were not striking up and down vertically, but horizontally. And as with each blow came a shower of sparks, these black figures appearing larger than life against the background of the open sky looked as if they were weeping lightning bolts in the clouds. So this, this kind of, uh, the 24 works described like uh, by the artist's voice from the time uh, was in the elevator. So when you took the elevator to go to the sixth floor, this is what you heard, the kind of, a strange, maybe a work and a half. Uh, so all this was like a 
a try to telescope those works from the beginning of the century to our time today because I thought that can be a kind of an interesting way of uh, bringing them today in a new format. Thank you very much. <laughs>